He thinks of it as a kind of invitation, not to a party, exactly, in fact, not to anything involving other people. This invitation is to listen, to open your ears to the incredible sounds of the world made by all the beings that aren't human. A good place to start? The dawn chorus, the sound of birds on any given morning as the day begins. There's this sense of the world waking up and that there is this world that happens all around us all the time, which, well, honestly, a lot of the time I sleep through that we're not conscious of. And so I think um, the dawn chorus, it is this drama that unfolds every morning. And once you tune in, it's hard to tune out. Alexander Hampton teaches religion at the University of Toronto. His work happens at the place where spirituality meets ecology. And his pandemic project, the Dawn Chorus, reminds him you can have a kind of sacred encounter with the non-human world when you least expect it. Just outside of my, my apartment building in downtown Toronto, in the middle of winter, and there was this um, very thick bush and it was full of sparrows who were sort of huddling and puffed up. And I stood next to it and I could see into it and I could see them and I could see, I could see right into the, the eye of a sparrow and I could see his little pupil dilating as he looked at me. It was, it was a, one of those moments that takes you far beyond, beyond words. By the way, that lovely encounter between Alexander and the little bird, not something he talks about very much, although he liked to. That, that moment I told you about with the sparrow is probably something I've told two other people, you know, because we tend not to have the language or the, or the ways to express that. One of the things I really liked about doing this project is the idea of finding a language which allows us to express this feeling of connection we, we have to nature. Alexander Hampton and the Dawn Chorus coming up. You'll also meet Nicole Persifield, the mezzo-soprano who lent her voice to the project as one of the human vocalists. I think the greatest change for me has been becoming more appreciative of the nature that is around me in the city versus feeling like I have to leave the city to go experience nature and to connect to it. It's caused me to um, seek out ways of connecting to nature and finding nature wherever I can on a sidewalk somewhere, even if I'm surrounded by buildings and just a few trees. It's all coming up today on Tapestry. I'm Mary Hines. The idea began early in the pandemic when it was becoming clear that as the world became less frantically busy, people were hearing sounds they had never heard before. For Alexander Hampton, an assistant religion professor at U of T, it was birdsong right in downtown Toronto. Hampton says now that so much of the world has moved back into high gear, traffic is full on, construction noise is everywhere. It's important to stay with all those other sounds, the music made by all the living beings that aren't human. Alexander Hampton is my guest. Hello to you. Hi there, Mary. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Let's start with the big picture. Early in the pandemic, you edited a collection of essays called Pandemic, Ecology, and Theology. What was your first inkling that, that COVID-19 might have a certain um, spiritual dimension to it? Well, it's interesting. I, I talked to a lot of people at the beginning of the pandemic. I think many of us, as we were sort of locked in, in our homes and apartments, were, were reaching out to, to friends and, and, uh, and talking to them. And one of the things I, I found that people were saying is, we're just sort of due for another one of these. You know, they happened in the Middle Ages and they happened with the Spanish influenza. And it's just uh, sort of the course of the way things go. And I wasn't really satisfied with that response because I, I feel like this pandemic has a lot of human causes to it. Human causes 
in the sense that paying attention to our proper place in nature. And that has to do with really bigger questions about um, whether we're respecting the boundaries between humans and nature, whether we're giving animals and um, ecospheres the spaces they need to thrive and sustain us and themselves at the same time. And what was it about the pandemic that inspired you to start recording birdsong in the mornings? The project came out of a conversation I had with a graduate student here in the music faculty, Nicole Persifield, who played an important role in the project. The University of Toronto is a downtown campus surrounded by a lot of construction, a lot of human noise, what one calls anthropophony. You know, that abated in the context of the lockdown. And the amazing thing that happened, you know, if there was any kind of silver lining to all of that, is that we realized we're actually surrounded by this biophony as well, which is usually obscured. And, and what does that mean? I, I just want to stop you there, Alexander. What, what is biophony? Well, biophony is the, is the sound that nature, or non-human nature really, uh, makes all around us. So we're engaged in making our own noise all the time, and you especially hear that in a city like Toronto, uh, construction, traffic, um, all those sorts of things. But all happening at the same time is the sound of birds, of the wind in the trees, um, and even um, all sorts of noises which, which actually don't even um, register in the human, the human ear, the sound of, of uh, trees growing, which we can register with instruments, or um, the, um, the sound of uh, insects going about their business as well. One of the uh, contributors to your book, Lisa Sedaris, wrote something I found really intriguing, that the, the very practice of listening to nature, j- just attuning to the world around you, can serve as a kind of spiritual exercise. Tell me about that idea. I teach a, a number of courses here at, at U of T uh, about religion and nature. And um, one of the favorite people that I, I teach is uh, Hildegard of Bingham, a 10th century mystic, a scholar, and one of the greatest composers of the high Middle Ages. And one of the things I, I find so fascinating uh, about her is she has this, this idea that we are, as humans, meant to be in tune with nature. And she, she even believed that Adam uh, in the garden, before the fall, spoke in song. This lack of attunement we have is a kind of disconnection from our proper place in in creation. And so as a composer, she produced a lot of music, and its intention was to bring her own religious community into attunement with the natural environment. And she explores this um, fascinating connection between attunement and atonement, uh, sort of making amends. And so she sees music as having this capacity of reintegrating us into creation, and at the same time, taking us out of ourselves, because music, of course, is more than than words. It has a, a kind of expansive cadence to it. Her, her music is very melismatic. Sorry, what do, what's melismatic? In music, you, you rest over a single syllable in a word for several beats. So there's one point in one of her songs where she rests over this word for about 70 notes, actually. And it, it has a kind of meditative quality because you don't just say the word, you sing the word and you sing all of the elements of that word in a way that kind of rests upon it and I think makes you think about it in more of a, of a deep way. So it's a kind of meditative way of, of speaking or, or transcending the particularity of the word to the, to the greater concept that's behind it. Tell me about the Dawn Chorus project you, you and your students have been working on. What are you doing? It started out in that context I, I mentioned before in terms of the pandemic and, and hearing the bird song again. But also as we as we moved out of the pandemic, this kind of relationship that I mentioned earlier, this kind of sense that there is nature all around us, we wanted to preserve that that awareness. Awareness is the first step to any kind of conservation. In the context of the project, the students in some of my classes went around and uh, recorded bird song on their mobile phones. And they used, um, there's this wonderful um, app developed by the Cornell Ornithology Lab. One student described it to me as Shazam for birds. There are over 25 species of birds on the downtown campus of the University of Toronto, which you would never think 
This was done during term, so not even during the height of the migratory season. Mm. And um, so that, that was kind of the first step. These recordings, they, they submitted them and they recorded some, uh, some of their own observations, but they also did things like poetry. And really, they, they reflected upon what it means to reconnect to nature. And they explored it in a, what I would call a, a broadly spiritual sense. And for some of them, that fit within the religious traditions that they're a part of. And for other students, it was um, something more secular, a sense of wonder and also a sense of the kind of resilience of nature within a context which is not very friendly to it. And so from there, those were um, all of my undergraduate students. There are about 100 of them. And from these wonderful compositions and, and reflections, we passed those on to some students in the uh, music faculty, some graduate students. Uh, so the composer, I, I should mention his name, uh, that's uh, uh, Gavin Frazier. Also a voice student, uh, Nicole Persifield. They're both doing doctorates. And uh, they transcribed some of the, the bird song into musical notation as well, which explores a kind of human bird dialogue. Well, we have a clip of that project. I, I, I want to just bask in that sound of, of the birds at dawn and, and, and then the musical composition built around that sound. It's called Awaken the Dawn, My Fair One. This whole project could easily be happening entirely within the music department or in a biology seminar or in an ecology class. Why does it find such a good home in a religion studies class? I, I think to put it in a bigger context, you know, we, we all know that we're in an environmental crisis right now. And, but the sad fact is we have all the kind of technology, we have all the scientific know-how to address this crisis we're in. And we seem unable to do it. And I think that points towards something much bigger, which is it's not our lack of knowledge or know-how. It's the kind of cultural and civilizational framework in which we, which we deploy that knowledge. And I think one of the greatest resources we have for addressing this problem has to come from exploring what I would call our effectual relationship to nature or our our feeling-based relationship to nature, um, our kind of spiritual or eco-spiritual connection to nature, something which I think often goes unspoken or unshared, but which is something that so many of us have, whether it's seeing the kind of flash of a cardinal uh, in a bush or whether it's vacation and, and seeing the Grand Canyon. I, and I think exploring, expressing, and empowering that feeling is actually one of the ways we can really affect change. Mezzo-soprano Nicole Persefield is here to tell you a little bit more about her experience with the Dawn Chorus Project. The easy part was probably enlisting the composer, Gavin Fraser, and pianist, Jeffrey Conker. But then, Alexander Hampton's students had to do the work of finding the other music, the bird song. Here's Nicole. After we kind of figured out who was going to be working on it, students gathered birdsong recordings from the U of T campuses of of the Dawn Chorus, which they had to get up very early to do. <laughs> and they collected those birdsong recordings. And then from there, we took those recordings, listened to them very, very intently, transcribed some of the birdsong into musical notation. And from that, Gavin drew inspiration and some material to uh, compose the piece. You know, it, you just listen to your environment then in a different way. When you're listening to it and thinking of making it into music, um, you start interacting with it differently, just feeling, you know, how it kind of emerges from this silence and then crashes over you as all of these birds start singing and announcing themselves to each other and where they are and their place, etc. 
there's this amazing part in the middle of the composition that says um, daybreak and it's I think the highest note I sing and it's like the loudest uh, Jeffrey's playing on the piano and it, it only lasts like this moment there's this huge crescendo leading up to it but in that moment this this big thing happens and then all of a sudden it it kind of fades quite abruptly it goes into a decrescendo and I always imagined it when I was performing it as though the sun has finally come over the horizon and all the birds just kind of feel that warmth of the sun <laughs> on them in that moment and then they just kind of are basking in its glow at, at that moment and it just goes into calmness so I think yeah Gavin's piece really captures a lot of what you can feel around dawn <laughs> Nicole Persfield with a sample of Awake My Dawn, My Fair One. You'll hear from Nicole again all through this episode. I'm Mary Hines. This is Tapestry. My guest is Alexander Hampton, who teaches religion at the University of Toronto. Tell me about a time when you've felt that connection in a profound way, whether just in a city street or on holiday somewhere, where you had a very strong sense of a, of a felt connection to nature, not something intellectual, but something very, I want to say primal, you know, just about the way you were feeling. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd love to regale you with stories of my mountain climbing, but I think really one of the best examples of that for me is just outside of my my apartment building in downtown Toronto in the middle of winter. And there was this um, very thick bush and it was full of sparrows who were sort of huddling and puffed up. And I stood next to it and I could see into it and I could see them and I could see, I could see right into the, the eye of a sparrow and I could see his little pupil dilating as he looked at me. It was, it was a, one of those moments that takes you far beyond, beyond words because you see a sparrow every day. But in that moment, the sparrow was more than just one of innumerable sparrows. It was it was an individual, an individual that I, I share my city with, that I share my my living space with, and, and that we often tend to walk by and, and ignore. And I think many of us have moments of, of, of that kind of connection. What you're describing strikes me as I don't want to say you felt a relationship with that sparrow. You're being seen. It's being seen. I mean, there's something you're connecting in some way. No, I, I think we can really call it a conversation, actually, because um, mm. and that's what the the Dawn Chorus project is about. It's uh, a conversation doesn't have to be well. It doesn't have to be what we're having right now. A conversation is is more than than words. It's also it is, but it is fundamentally a dialogue. It's making space for another. It's acknowledging a mutual relationship with another. And so often we are in what I would call a monological relationship with nature. We label it. We tend to impose our systems or views or our shapes upon it. There's no better example than the fact that, you know, I, I'm sitting here in the middle of a of a Cartesian grid in, in downtown Toronto imposed upon the landscape as opposed to, to working with it. I think, you know, going back to that bigger question of really dealing with our environmental crisis, it, it involves escaping what, what's often called anthropocentrism, a, a way of thinking which is completely centered upon ourselves. This project, the Dawn Chorus, is very much rooted in the city, in this case, in, in downtown Toronto. But there is this persistent impression that cities are somehow apart from nature, you know, nature, capital N, and that nature only exists somewhere else, in the wilderness, in the forest, in the ocean. Are you trying to mess with that idea a little bit? 
Yeah, absolutely. There, there is this sense that nature is something that happens apart from cities, that it is um, something confined to a provincial park. You know, and it's it is the sort of when I, if someone says to me, "Think of nature," I'll think of a whole lot of pine trees, for example. That's what will come to my mind, and then the the creatures that inhabit that space. But of course, what the students found doing this project is that we're absolutely surrounded by nature. We can't say that there are places for nature and and places for us. I think that kind of repeats the problem that we're talking about the the problem of seeing ourselves not as a part of nature. But we are sitting here in cities and we are still part of an ecosystem, Um, probably not a very balanced one, but nevertheless, we're part of it. And resilient nature persists around us. How can you devote yourself to a project like this, immersing yourself in birdsong without coming away from it changed somehow? Nicole Persefield sang the Dawn Chorus for Alexander Hampton's project. She says she's now more aware of what she's hearing the minute she goes outside. I'm much more aware of the fact that the sound is there, even if I can't hear it, because, you know, often that sound becomes drowned out as the sounds of the city pick up as well. And so just knowing that it's there gives me a sense of calm. I think the greatest change for me has been becoming more appreciative of the nature that is around me in the city versus feeling like I have to leave the city to go experience nature and to connect to it. It's caused me to um, seek out ways of connecting to nature and finding nature wherever I can on a sidewalk somewhere, even if I'm surrounded by buildings and just a few trees. I'm also more aware of the conversations that birds are having. You know, I'm just a tiny bit of a birder. I think a lot of people, <laughs> I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a serious birder. They would, you know, maybe scoff at me being saying I'm aware of that. But now I can hear the call and response so much more clearly than I could before. And it's really fantastic, actually, to just kind of have that whole world open up to me and realize all these, these conversations are going on and I was never even really paying attention to them. That was Nicole Persefield. She's a vocalist studying for her doctorate at the University of Toronto. And now, the performance Alexander and Nicole have been talking about. This is Awake My Dawn, My Fair One. Thank you. 
That was part of the composition by Gavin Fraser, Awake My Dawn, My Fair One, featuring mezzo-soprano Nicole Persifield and pianist Jeffrey Conker. You're with Tapestry on podcast and online and on CBC Radio 1. I'm Mary Hines. My guest is Alexander Hampton, who teaches religion at the University of Toronto. Sometimes animals in the city get treated as just vermin, you know, full stop, or annoying interruptions to human life. And I'm also in Toronto, and of course, I'm thinking of raccoons and Toronto garbage cans, among other examples. How do you live in that tension between thinking there is a way to be in conversation with these other beings in creation while knowing that they can make life more difficult sometimes? I have a lot of childhood memories of my father doing battle with what are sometimes affectionately called the trash pandas <laughs> of Toronto. The sort of explosion of, of a raccoon population because of the untidiness of human garbage is, is I think, uh, also an expression of us not seeing ourselves as part of this ecosystem that exists within a city. If we had spaces for the other uh, non-human inhabitants of the city. And if we think more constructively about building or rebuilding, as we're seeing all around this city, for example, rebuilding these cities in ways that are more ecologically sound, then some of those problems begin to abate because we begin to restore a kind of balanced relationship uh, with nature. But of course, the running battle with our raccoon population is, I think, more of a symptom of, again, our seeing ourselves as not a part of our own natural environment. This is reminding me of Hildegard again. I keep seeing the phrase decentering with regard to her work, that somehow we're removing the human being from the exalted center of the universe position and making space, perhaps, for, for other kinds of life. Is, is that a Hildegard idea? Yeah, I think that's an idea that's very strong within within Hildegard and within a lot of other elements of a whole range of, of religious traditions. You can think of notions of interbeing in Buddhism. In Hildegard's context, there is this notion of participation. It's the sense that all of creation is participating in something much greater than itself. And that greater than the self, again, decenters the human being from being the person or from being the species that is responsible or capable or has rather the right to reshape nature. Hildegard also has this idea, and I'm glad you're here because I don't think I've ever fully understood this. This is Hildegard's idea that we can be somehow singing ourselves into creation. You know, that phrase, singing ourselves into something. What did she mean by that, do you think? In the particular context of Hildegard's um, community, I spoke about Veritas, who is this sort of um, spiritual force in nature, responsible for its flourishing, its veridity, its greenness. For Hildegard in her monastic community, there's a deep connection between the model of Mary, virginity, and the capacity of the nuns within her community to act as channels for veridity. Their singing, their communal singing and their communal um, activities were ways of bringing veridity into greater being. And so that singing oneself into nature, I think, happens in that context. For us, we can take that idea which, which Hildegard explores of participating in something greater than oneself and expand it outwards to, to challenge our own anthropocentrism. And we can do that within the context of Hildegard's medieval Christianity, but we can also do it outside of it. And I saw, you know, my students in this project really reflecting on that. You know, Toronto's a very diverse city. We have a lot of students also from abroad, and they were exploring it through their own faith traditions, which all have elements of this decentering. It, it almost seems as though it would, would have been easier in Hildegard's time if, if you are a medieval woman living in community in a monastery. You're really not in downtown Toronto in the 21st century. I want to ask you about rituals. Are, are we hungry for ritual in the 21st century as a way to connect with the world around us? 
Yeah, absolutely. We're we're hungry for ritual. We've been hungry for ritual for a long time, particularly the kind of ritual that that we've talked about in relationship to Hildegard. By the time we reach the Reformation, one of the texts I teach is is as you like it. And there's this scene where the Duke, he's been uh, usurped by his younger brother and pushed out of court. And he finds himself exiled to the forest of Arden. And he has these beautiful lines because far from being upset as, at his exile, he says, uh, and this our life exempt from public haunt finds books in running brooks, sermons in stones and good in everything. Uh, for him, it's being displaced from the kind of courtly life of intrigue. And then in this private space, reconnecting to nature. And I think for most of us, it's in a private space where we reconnect to nature. Th that moment I told you about with the sparrow is probably something I've told two other people, you know, because we tend not to have the language or the, or the ways to express that. One of the things I really liked about doing this project is the idea of finding a language which allows us to express this feeling of connection we, we have to nature, to take it out of a, a very private moment and to bring it into a bigger conversation. And that's why I think this idea of, of nature connection, of feeling, and the role that arts can play in expressing it is one of our greatest resources to addressing the environmental crisis. Nicole Persefield is a talented singer, but it's not easy to be in sync with the music of birdsong. One limitation, Nicole is not a bird, and birds don't quite sing the way humans do. So how do you make a bird's melody something human beings can manage? Here's Nicole Persefield. Well, you know, they don't have the same vocal cords that uh, humans do to start off with. You know, we're, we're different species, so obviously we, we make sound differently. And so I, singing birdsong, I'm both aware that, you know, I am not a bird, I cannot perfectly mimic a bird and however even though I may be trying to um, you know portray the bird I'm still bringing myself to the table and and my emotions and my reflection of the piece. Birds of course just have a much greater vocal range than I could ever hope to have. I remember transcribing some of them and thinking oh I've got to bring these all down into the octave so they can be vocalized. There's also just things in birdsong that we just don't hear with the human ear. So they're communicating in this way that we're not even aware of just by listening. It was when I put it into this uh, spectrograph analysis that I could see vibrato and pitch slides and, you know, different ranges. And, you know, I'm stuck in my tonal Western <laughs> system and birds aren't thinking to themselves, oh, I'm singing D right now, you know. So there, there's that as well. The pianist is sometimes the environment, sometimes the bird, and I am sometimes the environment and sometimes the bird. So um, in the beginning of the piece, it, it really emerges from complete silence. And instead of being a bird at that point, I'm portraying the wind. So I'm letting all of these um, kind of almost sounds like exhales um, come out. So like a, on different vowels and different consonants. So it might be the vowel ah, just... I don't know if you can pick that up over the mic or <laughs> it might be say like an F morphing into an S sound. So, and just kind of capturing that environmental sound. And then within that, Jeffrey was um, playing very uh, soft chords around that with little fragments of like the birds just beginning to chirp, um, followed sometimes by like he would, hit the keyboard. Yeah, and so that was kind of like this um, conversation between the two of us. And then in the middle of the piece, when I was speaking about this huge crescendo that happens, I think we're both um, all of the birds at the same time <laughs> in many ways. And so then the piece is faster, um, much denser with a lot of music happening, a lot of rapid figures, a lot of fast singing with big, big jumps. And um, it kind of, I think, I don't know if you've ever heard the dawn chorus, but there's sometimes these moments where the cacophony, you know, might wake you up from sleep. And um, I think that was kind of uh, captured in that moment by the two of us 
playing that together and making, I guess, to speak to that, the conversation is part, the interaction with the pianist at that point is really about, you know, not only playing your, your musical part off of each other in a call and response kind of way, but also making sure you're, you're building the piece together in terms of the same musical structure and the same use of um, dynamics at certain times so that we wanted to make sure that we kind of reach the climax of the piece together um, and then how you analyze how you kind of come out of that in a way that is, is very smooth and still um, together as well. There are a lot of humming sounds, a lot of wind sounds, a lot of vocal slides, for example, mm, like into the note um, on a hum. Uh, the hardest thing I had to do that I had never really done before was move between a whispered vowel sound into a voiced vowel sound. So basically like using my voice later. So I'd start with say um, the vowel ah on a whisper and then I would move into the pitch that Gavin had notated. So that would sound uh, kind of like um, something like that and then you know throwing a slide in there at the end. And that's really difficult because as a singer, I was always taught to have what we call a clean onset. So you don't want a lot of, of air kind of moving through your vocal cords right off the beginning. You try to have a really nice clean start to your sound. Um, so that was something I had to kind of really play around with. And I don't think I was ever happy with it, but <laughs> it's fun to kind of use your voice in these different ways and ways you hadn't really thought about using them before. Vocalist Nicole Persifield. You'll hear more from her later this episode. I'm Mary Hines. This is Tapestry. My guest is Alexander Hampton, who teaches religion at the University of Toronto. You know, the feeling of impotence a lot of people have in the face of ecological damage, you know, climate change, wildfires, damage to the oceans. Part of the human response to that seems to be a kind of anxiety that leaves people unable to act. How do you think the sort of thing we're talking about, moving beyond language or, or trying to secure an emotional relationship to the world around us, how might that move people beyond that feeling of paralysis in the face of something so big and so distressing? One of the things I really enjoy about this project is many students come to my courses with a profound and not incorrect sense of eco-anxiety and a feeling of not being able to, to do anything about it. The, what's wonderful about the, the Dawn Chorus project is it looks a lot at, I think, what is more the positive side of that, that actually the resilience of nature is still present and amongst us in really remarkable and beautiful ways. Often our feelings of eco-anxiety, I think, are often accompanied by a feeling of nature alienation. Going back to what we were saying of nature not being something that was in the city. When people pull out their earbuds and start listening to the birds that are all around them, to the nature that's growing and, and even thriving all around them, I think that there is a sense that not all is lost. And I just go back to that sense that awareness is really the first step to conservation. There's life to conserve right here in the center of a gray city. That's a very strong message of hope, I feel, in the context of these, these huge worldwide global problems. But taking steps to conserve nature in our own midst is a, is a real way to address that. And more broadly, though, what that is really doing is cultivating and empowering a sense of ecological connection. And I think that also goes back to what you were saying about our feeling of being bereft of, of ritual. We do need to find new, new rituals to express our connection with nature. I, you know, I love the humility of, of this 
coming from you, because you are a scholar, you are a university professor, obviously PhD, and here you are saying, I'll tell you, language and words are only going to take you so far. And yet you've built a career on words in a very complex way. What's it like for you to step away from language and say, yeah, that's lang- language is not getting me entirely where I want to be on this subject? Yeah, I think that's that's one of the wonderful things about the study of religion. There's a constant debate about how we define ourselves in the study of religion. But I think one of the things that my colleagues might agree with is that language is one of the greatest challenges in terms of articulating religion. And I think anybody would have that experience, whether they are spiritual but not religious or spiritual within a tradition. We all have these effectual emotions about things, but we struggle with language to allow it to catch up to those feelings. One can write an awful lot about the incapacity of language to communicate. That's a a bit of an irony about the study of of religion sometimes. But religion is always interested in in challenging the the, the capacity of words to carry meaning or asking those words to carry more meaning than the words often carry. Uh, That's why you find, I think, that there is this natural relationship in religious texts with uh, things like like allegory and, and poetics and why There is this deep relationship between religion and spirituality and the arts as well, um, because they are all looking at at transcending the capacity of words to allow words or or feelings to be expressed, um, to go beyond the the meaning that words usually carry. That is one of the, I think, the defining, fascinating, frustrating and wonderful uh, things about working in religion. I, I want to make a little more room in our conversation for the music because that's that's um, something that's so much at the heart of this project. Why why do you think music is such an important way of connecting with the world around us? There are two things. One is the capacity of rhythm to connect us. Rhythm is something that's so primal and basic to us as human beings. It's it's something that's intrinsic to our biological selves and our in the beating of our our heart or our our waking and sleeping. It's also fundamental to the environment that's around us, to the seasons or the days. It's also something that's central to the spiritual lives of, of many individuals. I think that there's something about rhythm which connects our spiritual selves and our physical selves and our broader environmental selves together. And music, of course, along with poetry and other forms of art, have a, have a real capacity to get at that. And then the other component of, uh, of the composition, which I think is very interesting, is it's a composition for vocalese. There are no words to this piece. The intention is to transcend words, and in doing so, to transcend ourselves. And we're exploring, I think, in this piece, this, this capacity of music to allow us to transcend ourselves and to engage in a dialogue with nature. There was something else I wanted to ask you about rhythm before we move away from that, because we were we were on the cusp of something so interesting in terms of the primal nature of the drum. A guy who's great on this topic, his name's Mickey Hart. He was the drummer for the Grateful Dead, and he sees drumming as conjuring up the heartbeat every human being felt in the womb at the very beginning of our lives. Can you tell me about a time when you were profoundly moved by the rhythm, by the pulse? I have a particularly vivid memory, and I'll speak of rhythm in a poetical context too, because I think that's the other place where we where we find it. I remember the first time I ever read Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And if there's an ever, ever an ecological and religious poem, I think that is one. And it, it is in a ballad rhyme structure, so it is naturally a musical piece. And it's a fantastical journey around the world on the seas, and it has a, a kind of ecological catastrophe uh, at, at its beginning, a reconciliation of this person who does a horribly destructive act and then finds himself finally reconciled 
to both himself and to the greater natural world of which he is a part. I think the rhythmic quality of that ballad. Is there a passage that speaks to you, a particular moment in Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner? Well, there's nothing more shocking in that poem where the sailors are they're becalmed in an Arctic sea and they're visited by this wonderful albatross. And if you've ever seen an albatross, they're almost the size of a cesta. I mean, they're big birds. In kind of a, an act, which I think sadly so many of us can identify with it, just a destructive act that's unthought out, the mariner shoots the bird with his crossbow and does it without thinking. I think that says a lot about our feeling of nature alienation. We often do things which are destructive to the very nature of which we're a part without thinking. It's not because we sort of wake up in the morning and think we're going to, to do something nasty. We, we do it because we're, we're not cognizant of being part of our own environment. And then, of course, the albatross is hung around the neck of the mariner. And then there's this moment where he, after all, the, all of his shipmates have actually died, and he's there all alone on this becalmed sea. He finds himself looking at these um, slimy water snakes in the ocean, and he finds himself blessing them. And it's at that moment where he feels this connection to nature. He, he's, he once again sees himself as part of nature, and the dead albatross, which is hung around his neck, falls from his neck at that moment because it's a, it's a sign of... Going back to that thing we talked about with Hildegard, that's a sign of atonement towards nature. It's a sign of reconnecting to the creation of which one is a part. Uh, that, that was a poem I read, uh, I think, as a high school student. And, well, it got me to where I am now in, in many ways. Are there lines, are there a, a pair of lines that worked their way into your heart in terms of rhythm and the, um, the scansion of it? Once he becomes aware of being alienated from nature. There are these lines where Coleridge writes, and he's, alone, alone, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. Never a saint hath pity on me, my soul in agony. And that's the, the sort of depth of the mariner's sense of despair and, and, uh, and alienation from nature. And then there's that moment I, I described where the mariner finds himself not consciously, kind of unconsciously, transcending himself and, and reconnecting with nature. He describes these water snakes and then he says, and then I bless them unaware. That moment, that moment of uh, self-transcendence, that is a, a poem I enjoy sharing uh, with my students too, because I think we all find something of our, of our own story in relationship to nature in that very beautiful uh, composition. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, a story very close to Alexander Hampton's heart, and depending on your cultural taste, right about now you'll be thinking either epic poem or Iron Maiden. The poem is much older than the song. It was first published in 1798, and it has the mariner telling the story of a sea voyage to someone he's just met at a wedding. The powerful moment Alexander Hampton mentioned has the mariner gazing down into the sea. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire, blue, glossy green, and velvet black. They coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. O oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The selfsame moment I could pray, and from my neck so free, the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. A passage from Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Now back on land with Alexander Hampton. You, you've written that this the project of, of the Dawn Chorus 
is trying to tap into not just the sense of joy, but also feelings of, of disconnection, of displeasure. Why did you want to work those feelings into the mix instead of just an unalloyed celebration of the joy? No matter how much any of us wish to be ecologically aware and connected with nature, there are constantly moments where we fall away from that and we don't make decisions that are, are cognizant of being part of a, something bigger. And I think also, you know, one of the things we explored in the, in the composition and in the, in the work was also this sense that in being isolated together, we've also found something that's bigger than ourselves. I think that those things naturally must go together. We, we don't naturally, I think, maintain all the time a deep feeling of connection to nature. I think that's very hard for us, or at least for someone like myself living in the center of a city in a very um, altered environment. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm intrigued by the fact that this is the dawn chorus. Was there something intentional about that time of the day for your project? Did something about the dawn of the day call out to you, as opposed to, you know, birds and even song or something? It, it's a little bit like if you go to the symphony and you listen to that moment when everyone tunes right before it starts. Yeah, it yeah. Has that, yeah, that glorious noise. It really has that kind of quality to it. But then, of course, it is stretched <laughs> out over two hours or more at certain times of the year. But it also, there's this sense of the, the world waking up and that there is this world that happens all around us all the time, which, well, honestly, a lot of the time I sleep through that we're not conscious of. And so I think um, the Don Chorus, it is this drama that unfolds every morning that we often, we often miss. Also, the, the notion of a chorus gives you a sense of something coming together, something that, it's, that is bigger than the sum of its parts. And so at the same time, it also, I think, suggests, well, a cadence to the kind of ecology that one is a part of that goes on all the time without us often being aware of it. Just as we wrap up here, Alexander, someone listening right now, perhaps they have headphones on, earbuds in, maybe they're inside listening to the radio. What's something they can do right now to make the kind of connection we're talking about, to be a little less removed from the world all around us? I think this is something I, I, I've read of in, in so many students' reflections, you know, just pull out the earbuds and, and, and head outside and, and go for a walk because, you know, I know that here right now, downtown Toronto, where my office is, I can go outside and now that I'm attuned to this presence around me, I'm pretty sure that I would be able to identify at least five different species within 10 or 15 minutes. And that's here in, you know, gray downtown Toronto. It is all around us. The invitation to that conversation it is always there. That symphony is always being performed. It's wonderful that that invitation is always there. And once you tune in, it's hard to tune out. Alexander Hampton, what a pleasure it is to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for your interest in, in the project. Alexander Hampton teaches religion at the University of Toronto. His work happens at the place where spirituality meets ecology. That's it for us this week. This episode was produced by Armand Igbali and Kevin Ball. The senior producer is Rosie Fernandez. I'm Mary Hines. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for Tapestry in the Summer beginning next week. And we plan to be back for a new season with all new episodes in September. <laughs>